Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wesexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 235, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger streeter regulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello there, and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, which of your thousand faces do you have on today? I've got this rubbery one that ends in the back that, um, you know, looks like some poorly poured latex and has painted green hair. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm co- I'm completely wrong. That's my real skin. <laughs> I was going to say, it didn't look like you showed up any differently today. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did show up because we have a wonderful conversation ahead with David McGregor. Uh, playwright and author and a repeat guest here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. And uh, it's bound to be fascinating, uh, kind of two-hander. Uh, we've got two topics to talk with him about, uh, about his uh, books and about his latest play, including an offer for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere listeners for complimentary tickets. So make sure, everyone, that you stay tuned for that. And also, we have the canonical couplet, a drawing that we'll do that will include one of David's books. So stay tuned for that after the interview. In the meantime, the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose 235A. That's a little different than the series you're used to. It's because of uh, an unintended error on my part in an earlier episode, and I took away that short U- URL for use by another uh, another entry. So it's ihose.co slash ihose235a, using all lowercase letters and Well, you don't have lowercase numbers. They're just numbers. Uh, But that will take you to the page with all of the links. And we are going to supply some links for you related to David and his work and other things associated that are of interest. And, of course, at the top of the show there, you heard about uh, supporting our show as patrons. Uh, It's as simple as hitting the Become a Patron button. And, listen, we do prefer you to use that rather than PayPal. Because this year, in the months ahead, we are going to be offering some exclusive live events, and those will be happening through Patreon. They will not be happening for our PayPal subscribers. So if you if you are a PayPal supporter, get on over to Patreon and, and, and transfer your support to us over there. And if you are a patron, get ready because you're in for quite a ride this year with bonus content and live events. So thank you for that. David McGregor was born in Detroit and writes plays, screenplays, and novels. He's a resident artist at the Purple Rose Theater in Chelsea, Michigan, where seven of his plays have been produced. His work has been produced from New York to Tasmania. 
He adapted his play Vino Veritas into film, starring Emmy winner Kerry Preston, and his short play for old time's sake was adapted into the film Easy Way Out, starring John Savage. David adapted his trilogy of Sherlock Holmes plays, The Adventure of the Elusive Ear, The Adventure of the Fallen Souffle, and The Adventure of the Ghost Machine into novels. And he's author of the nonfiction two-volume series Sherlock Holmes, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, as well as the photographic history book Livonia. He's been hanged in effigy, and his writing publicly burned and teaches writing at Wayne State University in Detroit. He's inordinately fond of cheese and terriers. David, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. That's a really good bio. I wonder who wrote that. (laughs) (laughs) David, I've I've got a a question for you, David. It said in your bio that you were hung in effigy. Could you tell me and our listeners what sort of community... (laughs) Is effigy? Is that in Illinois? No, it's a little bit south of Flint. Oh, okay. And that's that's kind of a practice. Yeah, they've been doing that for years. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Bert, you're very astute to pick up on that uh, sentence in the bio, and I'm I'm glad you didn't pick up on what I picked up on, which was to ask David about his fondness for cheese and terriers. I've never had cheese and terriers. Uh, how how is it? <laughs> Well, I typically, I don't combine them, but uh, yeah, when I was in high school, that was when you went to the grocery store and you had your choice of American or cheddar. Um, I actually joined a male, uh, by male cheese club. Really? Yes, because I was that lonely and disturbed. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I got introduced to Port Salut and Camembert and... I just, to me, cheese is amazing. And, you know, my parents were Scottish, so we always had terriers. I've got two terriers. I just, they're just great. They're just my furry waterproof pals. Yeah. Well, you know, it seems to me like we have two topics to cover on trifles now on our other our other podcast. Uh, you know, cheese, I don't think we've covered cheese in terms of the foods in the canon, Bert. Oh, I'm sure we I'm sure we haven't. It doesn't pop up though. Well, Cheeseman's Lamberley. Yeah, that's, that's about, about it. it. Well, uh, what would happen if you had a little terrier named Roquefort? That, that seems to me to be a lovely crossover <laughs> opportunity. There. Oh, you could have two. You could have one Brie and one Roquefort. Brie, Brie. No, my my terriers are Boswell and McDuff, and they're a Scottish terrier and a West Highland terrier which uh, were the two terriers used for advertising by black and white scotch, which is where my grandfather worked. Wow. Really? Oh, that's grand. (laughs) The things you learn on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. This is amazing. Well, we're not here to talk about cheese, nor are we here to talk about terriers, perhaps unless they are bull terriers, but we are here to talk with David about a few things. Uh, One of the things that's been on our list, David, is your two-volume set, Sherlock Holmes, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, This is a project that uh, you started uh, quite a few years ago. What what was the inspiration for it? Uh, It was basically, um, I remember when the Jeremy Brett series first started uh, in 1984 on Granada Television. There was a lot of excitement uh, in Holmesian quarters about it. There was a quarterly publication at the time called The Armchair Detective that people wrote in. There was articles, there was letters, and um, there's so much enthusiasm about this is it. This is the guy. This is the definitive Sherlock Holmes. And I just found that really interesting because I knew that, uh, you know, 40 years earlier, Basil Rathbone was hands down, no question, the definitive Sherlock Holmes. And 40 years before that, William Gillette, hands down, no question, this is the guy. This is the definitive Sherlock Holmes. And then you saw the same thing to a certain extent with the Benedict Cumberbatch series. People, you know, responded really positively to it. And um, so you've got like four potential definitive Sherlock Holmeses, none of whom are remotely similar to each other. So a lot of times when I write stuff, it's to, it's to try to explain something to myself. And I thought, how can I work on a book or something that will help explain how these four really different interpretations of the character all came 
to be considered definitive. And so it's it's a kind of a, a look at the social and cultural backgrounds against which those Holmes interpretations appeared and why audiences responded so positively to to all of them. It's that's it's fab that's a great topic. You know, and you're someone, you know, with a with a terrier named McDuff. I mean, um <laughs> What, what's your sense? I mean, you know, you, you, um, you know, you're, you're such a well-established writer, scripts, books, plays. What do you think goes into creating an enduring character like this? Why is it that, that, and it's so unusual. I mean, it's not as if, you know, every 40 years there's a new Lone Ranger or there's a new Robin Hood. Um, what do you think is, what is it about Sherlock Holmes that, that um, just keeps connecting with these kinds of audiences and popular culture? Well, I mean, he's been described as like the first urban hero. Um, but I think it's more than that. I mean, I think you could argue pretty persuasively that Sherlock Holmes is the most successful uh, popular culture hero ever created. And it was the right kind of character at the right time in the right place with the right audience. And, you know, in the 19th century, there was a lot of consternation among the literary folk about, uh, on the one hand, we love the classics. You know, we love Homer. We love the Iliad. We love the Odyssey. But by the same token, when you look at classic heroes, they're not so great. I mean, like Achilles is like the poster boy for homicidal maniac, um, completely self-absorbed. And so he's not a very good example of uh, a modern hero. And in the 19th century, it was a real subject of consternation. You know, you had the so-called Newgate novels in the 1830s in which various criminals like Dick Turpin and Jack Shepard were criminals, but they were the heroes of these novels, and that's not good. And you had uh, novelists like William Thackeray or Anthony Trollope explicitly writing, this is a novel without a hero, because heroes are bad. Heroes are disruptive. Heroes cause problems. And then Arthur Conan Doyle came along. And, you know, the first two novels, Study in Scarlet, Sign of the Four, they did not make a huge impression at the time. But when the short story started getting published, all of a sudden the snowball started rolling. And it, it was like, this is it. This is a hero that we can get behind. He's not homicidal. He's not a romantic hero. He's trying to make the world a better place. And he's trying to solve people's problems for them, both uh, you know national problems, both personal problems. And uh, he became kind of the perfect modern hero for the kind of problems, the kind of situations that arise in a technological industrial society. Yeah, so th that's interesting, David, that you note how Sherlock Holmes really picked up with the, the advent of the short stories. As we look back at the first two novels, in retrospect, now that we have the full canon, do you think Holmes achieves his heroic status in either of those two novels, or does it really take the short story format to bring out the heroism in, it, heroism in Sherlock Holmes? Well, I think the heroism is inherent in both of the novels, but clearly, I mean, Conan Doyle was kind of feeling his way. Uh, in the first two novels, uh, Holmes and Watson lived together. But like I said, those two novels did not create a big splash. And so when the short stories began, he he moved them apart. And a lot of people, they seem to have this notion of Holmes and Watson joined at the hip. Uh, in the original stories that shot Sherlock Holmes to fame, they were not living together. And uh, Holmes was more of a traditional, isolated hero. And Really, it was only with the Basil Rathbone films that the idea of Holmes and Watson as a team really took off because that was not the case. Uh, for example, in William Gillette's play, it was not the case in any of the early silent films. It wasn't the case in the Ellie Norwood films. And uh, but this, by, by the same token, the seeds of his heroism are clearly there in Studying Scarlet and Sign of the Four. But it was the Strand Magazine, the short story format that really clicked and turned him into the cultural phenomenon that he has never ceased to be. You know, that's a that's a great point. I hadn't thought about that. But if you think about those movies, 
the Clive Brook pictures too. You know, Watson is just part of the furniture. And in Gillette's play, Watson is just part of the furniture. But also, you know, what you got in the short stories was the saga. If you want, if you want a hero, you know, what you need is a saga. And uh, it's, it's very telling that the very first short story was a failure for Sherlock Holmes. And it showed you this whole, you know, all of a sudden there's another dimension about the character. Well, you, that's part of the appeal of heroes. Um, you can't be uh, omniscient and omnipotent. I mean, Superman has kryptonite. Um, what makes a hero uh, more compelling is failure, is some kind of right. weakness that is then overcome. And, uh, the, yeah, the nice part about the stories is that they are, not only are they an ongoing developing saga, what Conan Doyle was savvy enough to do was he was throwing in references to other as of yet untold cases. And it built up this entire kind of mythology for the readership that made the character even more compelling. Yeah. So when you uh, set out to, to do this volume, David, I mean, it, I think it's um, probably easiest for uh, most people who have a passing familiarity with Sherlock Holmes to imagine the many actors who have portrayed Sherlock Holmes. I think it's some uh, hundreds and hundreds of actors, 200 and something films about Sherlock Holmes. Um, and And it would certainly be easy to go through that and and have a chronicle of all the actors over the ages. But I think what impresses us about your book is that it is comprehensive. I mean, you look at the entire development of the genre of uh, detective fiction and of uh, Sherlockians as well as uh, popular culture. Can you talk a little bit about how you decided to segment some of that and how you told the story as it evolved? Well, the first thing I wanted to do was to kind of understand the cultural and social background of the stories themselves. You know, there had been kind of halting steps towards detective fiction since Edgar Allan Poe's uh, short stories in the 1840s. But those never really took off. And then you had uh, Emile Gaboriau, had uh, Monsieur Lecoq, and you had uh, some of the so-called sensation novelists, uh, like Mrs. Henry Wood or uh, Wilkie Collins, they would include detectives in their stories, but they weren't the central characters. And so I wanted to figure out where this this new kind of genre came from. And it's kind of a combination of sensation novels and what were called casebook stories, in which ostensibly professional policemen and detectives told the true tales of their cases. You know, the best example probably being uh, Alan Pinkerton's 30 Years a Detective. And so the the detective story as we came to know it uh, was kind of a coalescing of the sensation novels and the casebook um, stories. And when it took off um, and then it got picked up by stage, by film, um, it obviously went in a number of different directions. And I could not have written this book. I mean, what really helped me, quite honestly, is the fact that the Internet exists, and various wonderful, you know, civic-minded people went to the trouble to scan um, all of these old newspapers and old movie magazines and old trade magazines because I didn't want to get just like bi biographical reminiscences of uh, of the original uh, films and plays, but contemporaneous reviews, and even better, um, they had publications from exhibitors themselves, even in small, tiny little towns. Here's how the movie did in my tiny little town. And so it pre pre you know, presented a really good cross-section of the way that Sherlock Holmes was resonating in big cities and small cities across the country. And uh, that was invaluable. And the nice thing about Sherlock Holmes is when you put Sherlock into a search engine, um, it pulls up its Sherlock Holmes. I mean, luckily he was not named Bob Smith. <laughs> yeah, I would have been doomed. Yeah. Now, what about what about Poe? I mean, um, I notice you know in your in your look back there into fiction and detectives, you didn't mention Poe. You know, Conan Doyle, of course, anchored everything in his experience of reading Poe. He said, "When when my mind was plastic." Uh, do you think? What do you think about Poe and his contribution to? And and why is it that that 
there wasn't any lightning after after Poe, really. That didn't Poe. Po, I mean, fabulous, fabulous stories, but you know, nobody said, "Hey, there's an idea." That's a really good question, and I, I don't know that I can provide a satisfactory answer to that. I mean, in the Purloin Letter and the Murders in the Room work, uh, Poe effectively invented a new genre. Or as the novelist uh, Jorge Luis Borges put it, uh, he invented a new kind of reader as well. And they did not catch on. Um, and Poe moved on to other kinds of fiction, other kinds of stories. But there's no question. I mean, um, Arthur Conan Doyle himself said he considered Poe to be the premier short story writer of all time. And took um, he was influenced uh, to a considerable extent by both Poe and Emile Gaborio. And um, in the stories themselves, in the Holmes stories themselves, Holmes will disparage Monsieur uh, Dupin and uh, Lecoq. But on a personal level, Conan Doyle himself was really impressed. And uh, you can say to a certain extent that Sherlock Holmes is kind of an homage to those earlier detectives. So when you were looking through some of these contemporaneous accounts or postings about uh, how the, the, the event, the, the, the play, the, the books, et cetera, were received. Did you run into any surprises? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like on the one hand, when you read it, it's a surprise, but then you kind of sit back and go, well, that makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, most notably when uh, John Barrymore made a film, made a Sherlock Holmes film in 1921, um, ostensibly based on William Gillette's play, but not really. And it was a big deal and it was a long film and it played for a long time on Broadway. Uh, Barrymore subsequently was appearing on Broadway in Hamlet. He was the biggest star in America and so big deal, big deal, big deal. But then you start reading the reviews that came in from smaller towns where the theater was basically a bench or hard wooden chairs. And you heard these complaints of our customers got a little uncomfortable, like this movie's too long. Um, there was one place in Michigan, they rented the film for one night. And the owner of the theater uh, wrote into uh, Exhibitors Trade Review I think it would have done well, but we had a Ku Klux Klan meeting in town that night. And so not too many people were able to come, but uh, the people who did come seemed to enjoy it. So you run into all these like very kind of tiny human little uh, stories about how people interacted with the early films and plays. Um, what's really interesting to me in part is because the first two novels were not protected by copyright, A Study in Scarlet and Sign of the Four, not only could publishers all over the world just rip them off, the same was true of people that adapted them into plays and different people, different guys just, hey, I'm going to make a study in Scarlet a play. And so versions of a study in Scarlet and the sign of the four, they blanketed small towns and cities across uh, across the United States. And so there was like, like this invisible wave of uh, Sherlock Holmes influence that it didn't really get recorded in, you know, official plays or official movie books or anything like that, but um, it was out there. Uh, so, yeah, I learned a lot. It was fascinating going through all that material. That's really interesting. And, you know, it's too bad that Michigan theater couldn't uh, grab a print of Illy Norwood's The Five Orange Pips to show on the for the Klan <laughs> meeting. Um, <laughs> you know, it could have served both audiences. Yeah, well, unfortunately, anytime you delve into human history, you are regularly uh, disturbed by uh, <laughs> what we will do. Yes. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why my line of Medea based Mother's Day cards has never gone well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you keep cracking. There You're going to keep trying. Trying. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it brings to mind the old Tom Lehrer Oedipus Rex uh, song. <laughs> uh, we we won't sing that right now. So, uh, uh, David, I mean, you've, it, you've got a wonderful uh, arc here from, you know, pre-Conan Doyle until uh, post-internet, essentially. Uh, and, and Sherlock Holmes is there throughout. What's your sense as to how this is going to continue to evolve into the decades ahead? 
Well, I mean, I can speculate. I mean, who knows? Because Sherlock Holmes has been dead and buried many times. Um, after uh, Basil Rathbone walked away from the role in both radio and film, uh, I mean, he himself said, that's it. You know, maybe it can work as a Disney cartoon, but Sherlock Holmes is too old, too old fashioned Victorian 19th century uh, for the modern age. And <laughs> it's done. And then in the 1970s, you had kind of like almost the burying of Sherlock Holmes as a hero because in films like uh, Murder by Decree or The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, uh, The 7% Solution, he's, he's an anti-hero. Um, he's not a great detective. He's a very troubled and damaged human being. And it's like, okay, that's it. We're done. But then the Granada series uh, basically brought the character back to life. And it was like, oh, this works. It's done. And now it's, okay, now it's done again. Uh, and then in 2010, well, basically from 2009 to 2012, you had the beginning of uh, Elementary, uh, the CBS TV series with Johnny Lee Miller, and then you had the Benedict Cumberbatch series, and you had the uh, Robert Downey Jr. films. And once again, Sherlock Holmes is kind of back at the top of the cultural heap. And so those those have you know kind of passed. So what now? It's got to be, I mean, you guys can weigh in, Um I, I think it's got to be something in the realm of virtual reality, uh, something like the holodeck uh, experiences of data in Star Trek, the new generation where you are homes or you can in, embark on an adventure in 1895 London. It, it'll probably so, be something in that direction, more immersive than we are used to um, or we have the technology for at this point in time. Yeah, I, I think oh. you're probably onto something. I mean, the, the folks at Frogwares have uh, the video game Sherlock Holmes that's out now, a uh, very detailed game. And I would imagine it's just one click away from uh, being part of a, an augmented or, or virtual reality kind of thing because it is so lifelike and immersive the way they've written it now they've got scripts that are followed so you, you obviously have to follow a whole timeline and and it's a decision tree kind of thing much like the choose your own adventure books uh that we may have read as children but um it, it is it is much more lifelike than i think uh we've we've seen before well i hope i'm alive to see it but here's my <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think in whatever, it, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, when virtual reality becomes what everyone thinks it's going to be, uh, that's when women are going to run the world because men are going to disappear. They're going to disappear into virtual reality. They can shoot things up. They can blow things up. They can go on dates with Marilyn Monroe. And I think, you know, men tend to be in general more, uh, kind of uh, fetishistic, more uh, focused on one thing, and it's going to leave women free to run the planet, which hopefully will be for the better. <laughs> Amen. Amen, <Yeah>. sir. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting in, in – um, I mean, there's so much going on here in what we're talking about. I, w I would just add a couple of things. You know, Rathbone – you know, what you're, for our listeners, what you're referring to here is Rathbone wrote this autobiography called In and Out of Character, in which he um, talked about, you know, all of that and sort of dismissed Sherlock Holmes and, and his right. sad experience. And Rathbone was like a 19th century guy. But one of the things he said in that book was, you know, the Gillette play, boy, he said, geez, this is creaky, old, melodramatic, you know, ready for the dustbin. Well, he died in something like 1967. And then in the early 70s, the Royal Shakespeare Company revives William Gillette's play, and it's a huge hit. So so people like Rathbone, you know, they become separated from popular culture. And the popular culture of the time, 1970s, 1980s, people were ready to take another look. And they said, gee, this is fun. And, um, you know, I think that cycle is is going to, to, to be repeated regardless of what the media is. And then the other thing about Holmes is, um, you know, this is also said a lot about Dorothy Sayers' detective, Lord Peter Whimsey. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're looking at the case, do you want to be Lord Peter Whimsey or do you want to be listening to Lord Peter Whimsey? In other words, with Holmes and Watson, do you want to be Watson? Or do you want to be Holmes? I mean, I would think it would be 
maybe even more attractive and more satisfying to be Watson. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And, you know, in, insofar as like the Royal Shakespeare's revival of Gillette's play, it's a good example of, you know, what I was referring to, the social cultural background of the audience. Um, it was not received in the same way. Um, and I can I can point to uh, when the Gillette, he made a he made a film of his play in 1916, which then promptly disappeared. And it was only rediscovered in 2015 and reconstructed. And it's available on Blu-ray. If you're a fan of Sherlock Holmes, I, I highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, but I went and watched it. Uh, there was a theater south of me in Ann Arbor, the Michigan Theater. They put the movie on. And they have a big organ there. They brought in a highly professional organ player. And the audience watched it. But it was not... I mean, frame for frame, you're watching the same film that people saw in 1916, but you're not perceiving the same movie. So at the, uh, you know, moments in 1916 where people would have gasped in awe and surprise and fear, a 2021 audience is laughing. It's now a comedy, you know? And I mean, even if people think about, like, for example, when the 1960 film Psycho came out, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, it was terrifying. It's the granddaddy of all mad slasher movies. Many people avoided taking showers um, after they watched Psycho. But if you show that movie to a modern audience, it is now a comedy. It is now largely a comedy. And it's the same film, but the social and cultural background of the audience is has completely changed and has you know changed their reception of the film. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really great point, how the sensibilities of the audience changes over time, even though the central character, the central story uh, does not. And we put our own kind of lens on it. And as we kind of wrap up talking about Sherlock Holmes as a hero here, you know, you mentioned earlier on that uh, it was Achilles who was the you know, original homicidal homicidal maniac. Um, and you also mentioned how in the, the 60s and 70s, how this this troubled Holmes was brought out, this uh, flawed human being. And that was, for the most part, swept under the rug, certainly in Rathbone's time. It was a very kind of two-dimensional character, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and certainly in the Cumberbatch series and the Elementary series with Johnny Lee Miller, uh, we get more touches of Holmes as a troubled individual as well as a, 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 an eminently capable professional. Um, do you think that this dichotomy of character is something that will continue to define Sherlock Holmes moving forward? Well, it, it enables different audiences to respond to the character in different ways. Um, and that's certainly true. If you look at the Cumberbatch series, it started out with, you know, effectively, he is a hero. He's brilliant. He's uh, physically active. He's eccentric. And uh, in those the first couple of seasons, he's, he's pretty much along the lines of uh, uh, Rathbone or even Gillette. He is a, as, as Conan Doyle said in his stories, a calculating machine. He's a machine. Um, he's not emotional. He's stoic. And then uh, in the Sherlock series, they abandon that in, in seasons three and four, uh, as Mark Gaddis once said, you know, based on the success of the series, we can do anything we want, which is kind of, that's the kind of hubris after which things crash and burn. And the fourth series, yeah, the series crashed and burned. If I mean, I know some people enjoyed it, but if you look at a lot of the uh, contemporaneous reviews or even what people have said about it on the Internet Movie Database, uh, they were, you know, the, the, the viewership dropped by half because now it's not that uh, brilliant, emotionally distant Holmes. Now he's weeping and sobbing and he needs a cuddle with his best friend. And uh, for some viewers, they like that a lot, but a lot of viewers were completely turned off by that side of the character. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is, there's so much to uh, explore and, uh, and your book, Sherlock Holmes, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, in two volumes, 
is a wonderful place to start. It is available from MX Publishing, our sponsors. Uh, you can check that out uh, in the show notes. We'll have a link to that as well as a link to the Gillette film, which we covered when it was initially rediscovered and restored, and uh, other things. So uh, please stay tuned for that. Now, also stay tuned right after this break. We'll be right back with David McGregor talking about his latest play. Stay with us. One of the great Sherlockian periodicals is back. The 2021 Sherlock Holmes Review. Edited by Steve Doyle. Art direction by Mark Gagan. With all new contributions from Nicholas Meyer, Robert Doherty, Frank Cho, Anne Margaret Lewis, Steve Hawkinsmith, Les Klinger, Jimmy Aiken, and more. 118 pages about Sherlock Holmes. The illustrators, community, collecting, comics, reviews, film and TV, scholarship, including new artwork, Irene Adler drawn by the inimitable Frank Cho. It looks like a book and reads like a magazine. It's The Sherlock Holmes Review. Get your first edition copy of this essential 2021 Sherlockian annual, the all-new Sherlock Holmes Review, at wessexpress.com. All right, we are back. David McGregor is still with us. He hasn't given up the ship yet. Um, David was here with us, I should mention, speaking of show notes, on episode 140, where he spoke with us about uh, his initial play, Sherlock Holmes and the Elusive Ear. Now, that is part of a trilogy of plays in which David places Sherlock Holmes in his proper time, but intersects him with other interesting individuals. There's, of course... Uh, the Adventure of the Elusive Ear with uh, Vincent van Gogh. There is The Adventure of the Fallen Souffle, where I think it is uh, Auguste Escoffier, uh, whom we meet. And uh, the latest one uh, that is making its way to the Purple Rose Theater in Chelsea, Michigan, is The Adventure of the Ghost Machine. David, tell us a little bit about The Ghost Machine. The Ghost Machine, uh, yeah, the first play, I thought it'd be fun to write a Sherlock Holmes play, and it got produced, and it did really well, and the theater said, wouldn't it be great if you wrote a second play? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. Um, So I wrote The Adventure of the Fallen Souffle, which has Escoffier and Bertie, uh, the uh, Prince of Wales, future King Edward VII, and that did really well. It was one of, I think, the theater's top two selling plays in the history of the theater, which is like over 30 years. And they said, how about a third play? And I, of course, agreed with having no idea what I was going to do. And I was thinking, okay, I need two contemporary historical figures, Annie Oakley, Wild Bill Hickok. Could I squeeze in Josephine Baker and Harry Houdini? And then my daughter wanted to go to uh, Greenfield Village, which is uh, like a museum and a village of historical uh, places. And I was in the bookstore and I saw a book talking about Edison and Tesla. And it just, that was my light bulb moment. It's got to be Edison (laughs) Edison and Tesla. God like that. Um, Because they're famous, they're brilliant, um, the right time period, and they hated each other. So that's what the play is about. It's uh, Tesla and Edison both have new inventions that have been stolen, and they come to uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, to help recover them because their loss could basically be the end of society and humanity. That's, that's the play. And I will say, if I can add, Scott, for all of the fine, upstanding listeners to IHOs, um, if you would like a couple of comp tickets – I'm easy to find on the internet. Just let me know. I'd be happy to uh, get you a couple of tickets. If you want to make a trek to Michigan, the play starts uh, in late April. It premieres April 22nd, and it runs through August 27th. So it has a four-month run, 
And the Purple Rose Theater, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the finest theaters in the country. Yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned that, David. And and please, if uh, folks would like comp tickets uh, and you happen to be in or near Michigan, just reach out to us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com and we'll make all the arrangements uh, with David. So, David, first of all, thank you for that generous offer for our fans. Um, and, and talk to us a little bit about uh, Purple Rose Theater. I mean, we, we mentioned it on episode 140, but just refresh our memory. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a famous name associated with the theater, but uh, the theater itself has uh, done some amazing productions over the years. Yeah, the theater was started um, over 30 years ago by Jeff Daniels, the, the actor Jeff Daniels, who's from Michigan, who lives in Chelsea. He lives a few miles from the theater, and uh, he wanted to replicate to a certain extent uh, a theater called Circle Rep that he got a start in uh, in New York, uh, where he met the playwright Lanford Wilson and um, was deeply influenced and impressed by him and started this theater, The Purple Rose, uh, in his hometown. And uh, they've done a number of Lanford Wilson plays. They've done a number of plays by Jeff. They've done a number of plays by by me. Uh, the idea is to create a kind of artistic home for Midwestern uh, playwrights, designers, directors, uh, actors, and it's uh, the the production qualities are off the charts. They're just amazing. The designers I get to work with. I mean, people, you know, if you want to go online and look at the this, this set, like the rooms of Sherlock Holmes, it's one of the most beautiful sets you will ever see. And the costumes are amazing. Uh, I am the prop person's favorite playwright because I write plays with lots of props. And the rooms of Sherlock Holmes, I mean, can you have a more fertile field for props than that? Um, not really. And so all told, um, it's... It's just a terrific theater. Uh, they do a week of previews where we get to iron out any issues there might be. And uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to have my work produced there. That's amazing. I mean, what a what a wonderful treasure to have right here in, in our backyard in Michigan. Um, when you, you, you mentioned going to Greenfield Village, which is part of the Henry Ford complex, the Henry Ford Museum. Um, you mentioned finding this book about Edison and Tesla. I mean, the, 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 the competitive nature between the two of them, um, you know, almost at each other's throats uh, in, in, in terms of business and science. Uh, it, it seems like there's a, a natural drama that for you as a playwright is already built in there. So can you talk a little bit about how you maybe take that as a central idea and build off of it to, you know, kind of create the the scenery of Baker Street uh, around them? Well, they were both brilliant, but they were brilliant in different ways and they had completely different priorities. Uh, Tesla wanted his work to benefit humanity. He thought all energy should be free and he does not look at it as essentially a money-making enterprise in comparison to Edison, who always calculated the value of his inventions by how much money they brought in and was not averse to um, borrowing other people's ideas or work and then slapping his name on it. And so he was of a much more like purely uh, entrepreneurial capitalistic disposition than Tesla, who was... uh, largely at the time viewed as kind of a half magician, half visionary, half charlatan, because he's talking about magnetism and he's talking about all kinds of uh, things that seemed almost impossible, you know, that he could create an earthquake just by tapping a girder in a building uh, with a tuning fork. And, And so they're completely disparate personalities. And Tesla worked for Edison briefly. And Edison, uh, the story goes, Edison said, you know, if you can fix these generators, I'll give you $50,000. And Tesla said, deal. And Tesla, you know, fixed the generators and then said, can I have my $50,000? And Edison said, you don't, you know, you're not American. You don't know how to take a joke. I was kidding. Hmm. And Tesla quit and uh, spent a year digging ditches in New York uh, before founding his own company. So they were not overly fond of each other, uh, but it was, uh, it was, you know, Tesla was more the, I mean, this guy was, like, he was like Newton, just a genius beyond genius. 
Well, and well, it was also it was also a time when you know there's a lot of conflict around the early days of electricity because Edison was championing DC direct current, and Tesla, I guess, was championing alternating current, and and that was around the time that Westinghouse got the patents for the uh, alternating current generators and what what's safer and how you can move electricity over longer hauls and all this stuff. So there was a really big economic undercurrent to all of this, particularly for Edison, who wound up losing. Undercurrent. Well, Edison, yeah, yeah. Yeah. His, his plan was untenable. I mean, you needed power stations every four blocks yeah. and copper cables as thick as my arm. Uh, and, but Westinghouse was on the side of Tesla and Westinghouse was uh, trying to you know be a businessman, but also you know he was trying to do it in an ethical, upright fashion, which is why Tesla, I believe, actually gave Westinghouse some of his patents when Westinghouse was in financial difficulty. Tesla said, "Let's not worry about the money." Mm. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the alternating current clearly won the day. It's that attitude. Let's not worry about the money that w- w- would enable you too to die penniless in a hotel in New York. <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> let, let's face it. Tesla had his ultimate revenge. I mean, even though he died destitute, as you as you note, Bert, much like Poe, um, he had his ultimate revenge because who's driving around in an Edison car? Now? <laughs> <laughs> well, Tesla got ripped off again by Elon Musk. Yeah. yeah. We're going to use the name of uh, the, of the super genius. Yeah. Well, and- okay. Rip, ripped off homage. Ripped off homage. <laughs> Who's to tell? <laughs> it's all. It's all a perspective. Now, David, thinking about these two iconic, uh, well, I guess we could call them heroes of a sort of uh, of, of the scientific and electronic age. Um, it seems to me that Sherlock Holmes would have problems with both of them. Um, we know how he held in disdain, uh, you know, Neil Gibson, the gold king, who was uh, unscrutable in his business practices. We know how uh, Holmes didn't appreciate uh, the supernatural, the magical, etc. cetera. Uh, and ironically, it was Harry Houdini in real life who was uh, the myth buster around spiritualism and everything that Conan Doyle believed in. So uh, on on the spectrum of Edison on one end, Tesla on the other, where does Sherlock Holmes fall in terms of aggregate personality? Well, he's clearly more towards Tesla. Uh, in the play, I have uh, Holmes trying to get up to speed with both these guys, and he's picked up some of the writings of Tesla, which are incredibly uh, humanitarian. All of his inventions, I mean, even he uh, it, theoretically maybe kind of, who knows, invented a death ray, that he invented it as the end to all warfare. That was the point of it. It would be the ultimate deterrent weapon. I mean, his father was a, a pacifist. He was a pacifist. And obviously it's ironic that you invent a death ray to create world peace. But his, his notion of, he has this one really moving uh, passage that he wrote, uh, when he cuts himself, he feels pain. And when a friend of his cuts himself, he feels that pain. And that even when one of his enemies cuts himself, he feels that pain. And that are we all not all one? And shouldn't we all work together and be together and help each other out? It's this incredibly, you know, philosophical moving passage that, you know, Holmes reads in the play. And that's what Holmes is about. He is about how do I help other people? How do I make the world a better place? And like Tesla, Holmes is not overly concerned with the financial aspect of it. He does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Well, and that's why he's a hero, isn't he? Yes. Um, so uh, the, we have the trilogy of plays here. Is there is there a fourth coming out, David? Have you been cajoled into yet another one? No, not yet. I was uh, a few months ago, I was talking to one of the people at the theater and that's, they kind of said, so what's coming down the pipeline? And I have no idea. And as I mentioned earlier, I just blurted out, I said, well, I'm thinking Harry Houdini and Josephine Baker. And this person got this shocked look in their face and said, dude, don't tease me. Don't tease me. Seriously? 
So I don't know. At the moment, I'm not writing that, but could it possibly happen in the future? And would that be a really interesting play to write? Because Houdini and Josephine Baker are, are two incredible personalities of the early 20th century, possibly. But uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I haven't typed, you know, typed the play out yet. David, it writes itself. <laughs> then you write it. <laughs> Houdini, Houdini gets into the milk jar, gets chained up. Josephine Baker comes out. Poof. Well, I would pay to see that. So, yes. Sign, sign me up. All right. Full credit to Burt Walder. Well, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see where that goes. I mean, I think one of the wonderful things here, David, that, you know, in talking with you, both of these episodes, is that you, you like many artists, find your inspiration uh, wherever you happen to be and, and in unexpected times and places. And I think that's where some of the magic is able to happen. Well, I guess I, I should give partial credit to COVID-19. Because when theaters shut down, uh, that's when I thought, well, I'll turn the plays into novels. And that's when I thought, well, I've got all these notions about writing a nonfiction book. Um, and as it turns out, I'm really, really good at social isolating, kind of a <laughs> savant, really. Either that or other people are really good at avoiding me. Uh, so I just sat down and typed and, and, and got some stuff done. That is amazing. Well, and we are all the beneficiaries of it. If you would like, you can get uh, this trilogy of plays in book form in under one cover from our friends at MX Publishing under the title Sherlock in Love, the Holmes Adler Mysteries, or you can get each one individually, also available from MX Publishing. We'll have a link to those and to all of David's books from MX Publishing in the show notes. David, thank you once again for joining us here and for your generous offer to fans of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Again, if uh, folks are listening and would like to attend the play sometime between April and August in Michigan, hit us up at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com and we will get some comp complimentary tickets to you. David, thanks once again for joining us on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, thanks for having me. And I guess I should add, I said I would make the comps available to the fine, upstanding listeners. I'll also include the no good scallywag listeners, too. Oh, it's, good. That includes Bert yes. and I. Yeah. So anybody that wants to come see the play, um, just let me know or let, uh, let Scott and Bert know. Excellent. Thanks All again, right. David. Okay. Thanks for having me. just a joy to talk to David and what a great conversation I mean think about the gamut of things that we ran here about homes popular culture the roots of fiction where ideas come from from plays Tesla um, you know it's a it's it's always a real shot in the arm to talk to David and it just shows you that this whole question this whole subject of Sherlock Holmes and popular culture is really endless it really is. And, uh, you know, I, I hate that we put the pressure on him for yet another entry. Uh, I'm sure he'll get there. But uh, wa watching him squirm in the meantime is uh, is not exactly what we intended. But I guess that's what happens when you find uh, an author, a creator, uh, that is, you know, maybe they feel they're done with their creation. I just like Conan Doyle. You know, people clamored for more, and he kind of held his nose at the topic and and held out uh, essentially for more money. <laughs> I mean, if you and I ever decided that we had had enough of the podcasting gamut and we're going to hang up our microphones, I mean, how how do you suppose everyone would respond? I think I think with a hum and a ho, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm in a ho and a ha. Yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing about being creative, you know, and Conan Doyle is a great example is um, construct, you know, and he said this several times, constructing a plot, you know, he, he once described himself in a talk. I think this is the talk that Glenn Maranker has on display at the Grolier Club. Um, he once said, you know, for a not particularly observant fellow, 
basically, he says, for somebody who's not particularly observant to have to come up with these details and these plots, you know, it's just a chore. And, um, you know, he just he just found it wearying and he didn't really have a, a sense of of the fabulous character that um, that he had created almost incidentally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it seems to me that someone like Conan Doyle or let's be more specific, Conan Doyle, um, when he did have a plot line, uh, the incidental part, the easy part was simply writing the dialogue and 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 the setting and the description and all but coming up with you know what mystery is it that holmes is going to solve or what uh situation is he going to help someone extract themselves from that that really is the 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 most difficult part i would imagine yeah well and you know it's interesting particularly having talked to david because you know conan doyle was not hugely successful as a playwright i mean his sherlockian plays you know, did bring in an audience, but he didn't really have, at least in my opinion, for whatever it's worth, he didn't have a great grasp of how to how to structure something for the stage about, um, you know, the intelligence, you know, about stagecraft and surprise. And I mean, he did did do things, you know, the snake and uh, the phonograph and, and, and things. But he was he was, you know, no Tom Stoppard was, uh, was <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle. No, I think that's uh that's a really great observation. And we've talked to uh, a number of playwrights here on the show uh, back in, oh, I guess episode 10, we talked with uh, the, the team that was behind the, uh, the Shakespeare company in uh, the Berkshires that was putting on a Sherlock right. Holmes play. We've talked with Ken Ludwig. Yeah. We've talked with David McGregor. I mean, there are yeah. talented people that, you know, make this their specialty and clearly they're very good at what they do. Well, particularly Ken, you know, you read anything that Ken writes and it's like a masterclass in playwriting. And he's talked about so many of these things when we were talking to him. He talked about from a Shakespearean standpoint, you know, the trip to the magical place and how the rules all change. And, and uh, you you know, they're, they're, he's a master. Yeah, he's a great example of somebody who's a, like David, who's a master of this craft. MX Publishing recently launched the MX Audio Collection, an app with a series of interviews and other audio content, beginning with Lee Child talking about Reacher and Sherlock. There are many more interviews lined up for 2022, including Jeffrey Hatcher, screenwriter for Mr. Holmes, Otto Penzler, the founder of the Mysterious Bookshop and Mysterious Press, authors like Bonnie McBird and Nicholas Meyer, and yours truly, Scott Monty and Burt Walder from I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Every month, MX will be adding in at least four new Sherlock Holmes stories and some more theater performances. There'll be more from the deductionist Ben Cardall, too. You can read more about the app and sign up for the MX Audio Collection at iHose.co slash MX Audio. That's all lowercase, iHose.co slash MX Audio. There's a monthly subscription option and an annual subscription option with a significant discount. And iHost listeners get an additional 25% off of any subscription you choose just by using the code IHOSE when checking out. A percentage of the proceeds of the app go to Undershaw, the school for children with learning disabilities. It was the former home of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who of course wrote many of the Sherlock Holmes stories while he lived there. So go to iHose.co slash MX Audio and use the code iHose today for the MX Audio Collection. And it's time for everyone to take out their pencils and paper and get ready to write this down because it is, yes, another canonical couplet where we give you two lines of poetry. And we ask you to come up with which Sherlock Holmes story we are referring to. The last time in these parts, you may recall, we gave you this clue. A Vesta buried in the mud. It had been a rainy night. Had the inspector imagination, he could rise to greater heights. Bert, do you know which Sherlock Holmes story we are referring to? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is the case where Holmes had to use a mirror to crack the case of the disguised old eccentric. This is the story Watson called The Veiled Codger. There it is. There it is. The Veiled Codger. Well, um, Bert, you uh, are, you know, in, in your guise as an old codger, uh, you do pretty well. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Well, no, you were slightly off uh, oh, this time. And oh, um, I, I have to inform uh, our listeners, if, if they didn't know already, it is the adventure of Silver Blaze. Oh, goodness. Silver Blaze, yeah. And uh, they didn't really seem to need a lot of help this time because I think we had a record number of uh, of, of entries this time around. So uh, I think what we have to do is bring the extra large prize wheel out here and give it a big spin. And... <laughs> Watching it go around here and seeing it stop on number 57, number 57. And that looks like it is Andrew Van Loon. Andrew, congratulations. We will be sending you, what was our prize last time? Hmm. Who was here? (laughs) <laughs> Who did we talk to in the last episode? It, oh, Ross new... and Ira. Well, yeah, we're going to send a copy of uh, Masterpiece of Villainy. Oh, I thought it was a new car. <laughs> well, well, wait a minute. I have I have the sound effect for that. It. Uh, you say a new car? Yes. <laughs> That's the horn on that car, actually. Oh, nice. You won't enjoy driving that down the street. No. no, we will have a copy of A Masterpiece of Villainy from the BSI Press on its way to you, Andrew, so stay tuned for that. Well, now we have this episode's canonical couplet, so kids, get your pencils and paper ready. Here it is. A morning dash to Charing Cross. There's winter in the air. This inspector's seven cases are in Watson's notes somewhere. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment that I hear of Sherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose your name at random, you'll win. Good luck. And like we said, we will have a book of David McGregor's for you, and we will leave it up to the winner to decide which book he or she would like or they would like. So, uh, wow, I can't believe we've done it. We've gotten through episode 235 here, Bert. Um, Any last thoughts before we close out here? Because I I do have one, but I wanted to give you first right of refusal. Oh, thank you. No, I don't have any... um... I just have continuing thoughts, and they're all about trivia. So, <laughs> okay. It just shows you the essential, tr- the essential shallowness of my personality. It's, I, it's good to know how your brain works, though. This is, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and- for example, look, if I had a pencil that took 7 millimeter lead, but I had a particularly rough piece of 5 millimeter lead, how long could I write before the lead fell out? I mean, these are the things that I... <laughs> two millimeters. You, know, I just, you can write yeah, two millimeters. <laughs> Well, wait a minute now. If I write, how long would it take me to write two millimeters? It depends on how small your letters are. Well, but that's an Australian aardvark. Oh, you can't. Goodness. <laughs> wait a minute. How much change would I have in my pocket? <laughs> and, and folks, now you see why the canonical couplet is the way it is. <laughs> Ah, well, thank you for that interjection. What's your closing thought? My closing thought uh, is, oh, we have a new Sherlock Holmes community that we have established. There, Years ago, we established a Sherlock Holmes community on, uh, well, first it was on uh, the the do-it-yourself social network, the white label social network. I forget which one that was, but we just created that. Uh, And then we did, we we transferred that over to Google Plus and Google Plus went the way of the dodo. Well, now, uh, because we clearly have uh, our sites set on Twitter and and third time's a charm, I, I guess when we touch them, they'll go down too, but we have a Sherlock Holmes community on Twitter. So if you 
are the type that uses Twitter, uh, let us know. We will put a link to the Sherlock Holmes community there. Um, just ping us on Twitter. We are at I Hear of Sherlock. If you'd like to be part of this community, we just started it days ago. It's already at about 150 people or so. And um, we are playing with it and seeing what kinds of things we can do, uh, discussions and questions and content. And once again, this is uh, something that we want to encourage everyone, no matter what their interest in Sherlock Holmes is, how Sherlock Holmes drew you in, in whatever form, you are welcome in that community. And as part of that, something that we may try on Twitter is something that's called Twitter Spaces, which is basically a live audio program. And it would basically allow us to do our show or to do something as a bonus episode from our show where we can have a conversation with listeners. You can hear us banter live, but we can also have people chime in and come up to the microphone and join us. So whatever you think of these two harebrained schemes, let us know. Send us an email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. And if you want access to that Twitter community, say it in the same email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. We would be delighted to hear from you and to have you on board. Yes, and it's particularly our objective because of the current limitations of Twitter to build an audience on Twitter spaces of at least 280 characters. <laughs> well, it was all but a Twitter to me. I can't remember which episode or, or which, uh, which story that was in, but Sherlock Holmes did mention Twitter at one point. Yeah. So that is our connection there. And hopefully it'll stick this time. So, oh, Ning. It was Ning. That was the social network that we used. And that, of Ning. course, has gone the way of the dodo since then. I was thinking we should check out this AOL online thing. That sounds pretty good. It Well, either that or if that doesn't work out, you know, if this Internet thing doesn't catch on, um, we will just revert to uh, Telegraph. Oh, I'm a big fan of that. But what about MySpace? Your space? I've never heard of it. <laughs> 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 well, until next time, this is the appropriately socially networked Scott Monty. And this is the guy still rubbing carbon paper stains off his fingers, Burt Wolder. And together we say, The, the Games, games of foot. foot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Games, games of Foot. foot. <laughs> I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.